Thank you everyone for joining me. Welcome to the Ask Dr. Khan Show. Today is episode 121. I'm so excited. I'm Dr. Peter Khan, functional medicine practitioner. And for the past 121 weeks, we've been bringing you information that's going to help you solve your health puzzle and help you get well and stay well. People usually come to us after they've been to all the other different specialists, medical doctors, taking a bunch of supplements. Nothing has worked until they seek our help. The reason is because we take you through this journey, this roadmap that actually help you identify the underlying root cause of the condition. So today, I'm going to talk about the roadmap for digestion. Now, there's a tract, that's why it's called a gastrointestinal tract, that the food has to go through from chewing, digestion, absorbing it, and elimination. So I'm going to go through this digestive tract today to give you some basics of just anatomy and physiology and then where things might break down. So you can actually use that information and see what type of symptom you have. For example, gas or bloating versus reflux heartburn versus you know uh, feeling like the bowels don't empty completely or have foul smelling gas. Every single symptom that you may have in the GI tract means something different if you know what to look for. So my goal today is to not to make you self-diagnose, self-treat, but to make you understand that there's a reason for those symptoms. And if you work with a doctor like myself who can identify those symptoms and take a careful history and do the right test, you'll be able to know what's causing your GI symptoms and be able to solve it. So let's start with identifying the different parts of the GI tract. So digestion, we're going to talk about digestion today, starts in the brain. Say like brain. So when you, that's obviously my, not my hair, it's long hair. So when you see food, your brain gets excited, right? You see food, in fact you smell food, and you may be even touching food, touching bread or cookie, whatever, your brain says, hey, this is food, I need nutrients. So digestion starts in the brain. So that's why it's so important when you're eating food, you wanna sit down, nice music, eat with company you enjoy, and most importantly, slow down your eating. You should masticate. So digestion starts in your brain, and then once you put the food in your mouth, you have to chew the food. You must chew the food because that chewing and the grinding alone mixing with the saliva, something happens there that's magic. You know, that mortar and pestle action with these digestive uh, saliva enzymes help break down the food in your mouth already. Now, mostly it's carbohydrates that gets broken down in your mouth through saliva am amylase, but protein and fats typically does not break down in your mouth. So you gotta chew them really well into small tiny pieces before you swallow so that your stomach will have an easier time to digest smaller pieces of food and also have more surface area to coat it with enzyme and digestive juices so you can digest and break down food. So chewing is so important. Many of us rush through lunch. We don't chew or we are rushed through drive throughs and eat while we're driving, you know, on the way to work and put makeup on at the same time. Not me, but maybe you if you're a lady. But when you don't sit down and slow yourself down, to slow the pace of eating down and really chew your food, digestion is really compromised. So you got to be in the right frame of mind to eat, folks. It is so important. I think most people in America, we get, I mean, even my kids in school, they get a 20 minute lunch break. I'm like, what the heck is that about? That's not good for the digestion. You got to slow down. And, and enjoy your food, okay? And that's not to mention what type of food you're putting into your body. That's a different topic. But once you have food, you must chew it. You must be in a relaxed state of mind to digest your food. Once you eat the food, the next part that's gonna come is gonna be your stomach. So in your stomach, your stomach's gonna secrete HCl, hydrochloric acid, stomach acid. Okay, now that stomach acid is key for you to break down protein, primarily, okay? And also absorb minerals, things like calcium, iron, magnesium, right? These things that you typically take in a supplemental form, 
Forget about it. If you don't have enough stomach acid, you can't absorb any of these. And so many people are taking calcium and magnesium when they really should be working on correcting stomach acid deficiency. When I say stomach acid deficiency, again, most medical practitioners in Western medicine, they see stomach acid as the ultimate bad guy or as the ultimate scapegoat for anybody with any kind of GI symptom. If you complain of heartburn, reflux, indigestion, anything, even burping, like anything, they'll give you stomach acid suppressors, either proton pump inhibitors or H2 blockers or even just antacids to shut down stomach acid. But what you don't realize is this stomach acid is the key to digestion. And in fact, if you look in physiology textbooks, it'd be very hard pressed to find a physiological reason for why you would make too much stomach acid. It's simply just very difficult to find. You're just not gonna find it. But there are many different mechanisms that can actually cause you to have less stomach acid production. One of which is low thyroid. Many of our clients come to us with thyroid complaints. And if you have low thyroid function, stomach acid secretion, and really, for that matter, all digestive enzyme secretion, and really, for that matter, all metabolic function slows down, including digestion, when you have low thyroid function. So if you have low thyroid, that can contribute to stomach acid deficiency. If you have decreased brain function, see your brain, there's a nerve from your brain that innervates the GI tract, and that nerve is called the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is not, if it's not firing properly and innervating the gut, you're also gonna have decreased stomach acid production. So you gotta have Brain, proper brain function. And how do you know if your brain's not functioning 100%? Usually, if you experience brain fog, difficulty concentrating, you have fatigue, your brain endurance goes down when you do certain tasks, like you read, or you want to fall asleep. You drive, you want to fall asleep. You, know, you do anything mentally demanding, you want to fall asleep or you get drowsy. Or you have uh, memory loss, you have depression, anxiety, those are signs that your brain's not functioning properly and you may have decreased vagus nerve output that's gonna cause your stomach to not be able to produce enough stomach acid. So thyroid and brain are two big things that I see very common for people to have low stomach acid production. Other things that can shut down stomach acid production includes things like uh, H. pylori. If you have an H. pylori infection, H. pylori is a bacteria, Helicobacter pylori, that can also shut down stomach acid production. So gut infection needs to be ruled out. If you have things like um, stress, you know, if you're in a, paras in a sympathetic fight or flight response, uh, then you're also gonna have decreased brain output. You're gonna have decreased parasympathetic innervation to the gut, and you can also have decreased stomach acid production. So you see, there are many, many, many different reasons for why you will have not enough stomach acid production, but very few reasons for why you have too much. Now, why does those antacid actually help with the symptom of uh, burning and reflux? The reason is because when you don't digest food well from not enough acid, the food actually sits there and they rot. The food that rots and putrefies, especially protein, forms acid, like lactic acid and different type of organic acids, and that's the acid that you feel from the heartburn and reflux. So really, if you experience heartburn and reflux, really you need to think about how to correct a hydrochloric acid deficiency. And if more than that, more than just correcting it, it's, it's about finding out why you have a hydrochloric acid deficiency, which is what I just want to explain to you. Thyroid issues, brain dysfunction, uh, H. pylori infection, cortisol issues, stress. So you gotta identify the underlying reason instead of just taking something. Always, always understand why. So as we continue down the GI tract, now we have pancreas. Pancreas is an organ that typically people associate with insulin. Insulin, of course, is involved in blood sugar metabolism, right? But know that pancreas secretes digestive enzyme, like lipase, pancreatic lipase, pancreatic amylase. So these are enzymes that break down fats and carbohydrates. Also uh, protease, so pancreatin, pancreatin. It's basically enzymes secreted by the pancreas to digest protein. So basically your pancreas not only controls blood sugar, it also is very important in secreting enzymes to help you break down food stuff. So if you have pancreatic dysfunction, then you may not be making enough enzymes and that can lead to symptoms 
of gas bloating. The, typically, this is coming from carbohydrate fermentation. So the symptom of pancreatic issue, typically gas, bloating, not digesting food well. And so now why would your pancreas not make enough enzyme? Again, this vagus nerve that you see here goes all the way down to the pancreas as well to help secreting enzyme. The other thing that helps the pancreas secrete the enzyme is actually the HCL, the stomach acid. You need proper amount of stomach acid to stimulate your pancreas to even release the enzyme. So again, if you're not making enough stomach acid or you're taking a stomach acid inhibitor, then that's going to block your pancreas' ability to make digestive enzyme. And therefore, you digest even worse and re-exacerbate the problem. That's why so many people are taking these medications that shut down stomach acid and their digestion is just, just as bad. They may not have heartburn reflux, but now they trade it for gas and bloating. They trade it for IBS. They trade it for gut dysbiosis, meaning you're growing bad bacteria because you can't digest the food. So the food that's not digested sits there and the food becomes infected with candida and yeast and bacteria. Then you get SIBO, all because of not enough acid, causing not enough enzyme, and now you're not digesting food, so you're fermenting against. So what happens with, with this and this, they can mimic a gut infection, like SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. People with SIBO will have fermentation and gas and bloating, and so SIBO is kind of the sexy thing. It's like the new popular diagnosis. So everybody gets called that you have SIBO, but one of the common causes for SIBO is low stomach acid and low pancreatic enzyme production. And one of the things that can mimic a SIBO, but it's actually not SIBO, is actually stomach acid deficiency and not enough enzymes. So again, we want to take a really detailed history and run the right test, combination of which will help us to arrive at the proper assessment of what's really going on. And the assessment will determine what type of tool is used because different enzymes fix different problems. If it's more of a hydrochloric acid, more of a gastric issue, we want to use enzyme HCl+, which is a product that we use that includes betaine hydrochloric acid. If it's more pancreatic issues, depending on the situation, we may use brush border enzymes, enzyme that lines the pancreatic lining to help you with the breakdown of the thing. We may use also other enzymes that are more help with breaking down fibers so that we can break down these carbohydrates so the bacteria doesn't ferment against it and thereby reducing gas and bloating. So the supplement are tools. Tools are used depending on what's wrong and what's going on, not just everybody taking the same thing. So a lot of people self-diagnose, self-treat, go to GNC, buy whatever they think is best, which is, you know, you're trying your best, but if your symptoms not improving within a month or two, then you need to go down a different route, right? If you're not improving and you keep taking the same thing for years, then you need to go down a different route. And that's what we do with our clients. We go down a different route if it's not working, okay? Now the next, after that, we also have the gallbladder. Let me use brown, We're sticking with the theme here. So we have stomach, we have pancreas, we have the gallbladder also secrete into the digestive tract. And the secretion there is bile, okay? bile acid, bile salt. Okay? Bile from gallbladder is secreted into your GI tract to help you with fat absorption, but also help with toxin elimination. In fact, bile is what binds the hormones to help you eliminate excess hormone in your body. So a lot of female with menstrual irregularities, with fibroids and uterine uh, fibroids and cysts and endometriosis and heavy bleeding, typically will see some type of gallbladder issue. Now, if you say my gallbladder has been removed, exactly. That's why it's been removed because there was a problem causing you to have these female hormone issues because it's so important in toxin and hormone elimination, as well as fat absorption. So digestion, for you to digest fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin A, D, E, and K, you need proper bile production. So gallbladder is involved in digestion, the pancreas is involved in digestion, stomach obviously very important as a first stage in breaking down protein and absorbing minerals with hydrochloric acid. And then as we continue down, the next organ that we come upon is your small intestine. 
So know that stomach is where the food is starting to get broken down, particularly protein, but your small intestine is actually where the nutrient is being absorbed into your body. You absorb the nutrient in your small intestine. The small intestine has three sections, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum, so three sections of the intestine. And the intestine doesn't really make any enzymes or anything like that, it just absorbs the nutrient like I said. Okay? Now what can happen here is you can have things that can go wrong, including but not limited to two, leaky gut syndrome. Now, I'm going to start to not write leaky gut, okay? not, or not say leaky gut, but when I do, I'm going to tell you it's hyper leaky gut syndrome. Well, what's the difference? Is it just semantics? Yes and no, because we all have leaky gut. Normal people have leaky gut on a normal physiological basis. It's the way that your intestinal lining actually samples the environment. It's a way for the immune system to survey, sur do surveillance on the environment in the intestine to see if there's any bad guys coming along in your intestine that they need to take care of. So we all have leaky gut to some degree. It's when it becomes hyper leaky gut, too much, that's when it becomes a disease process. Or well, I shouldn't say it's a disease process. It can lead to diseases like autoimmune disease, such as thyroid, Hashimoto's, various autoimmune issues, and food sensitivity. So hyper leaky gut is what can happen in the small intestine and leads to malabsorption and inflammation. Now know that when you have inflammation anywhere in the body, if it's in the gut, you can have inflammation everywhere. It's a systemic issue. If you have arthritis in your knee, if you have knee pain and you have arthritis there, or you just have knee pain, guess what? You have inflammation everywhere. Why? Because that inflammation chemical, that's, that soup that's building, like when you have a swollen elbow because you bend your elbow, that inflammation and all the chemicals that's there to try to heal that area, every time the the heart pumps, you're pumping all that inflammation chemical throughout the entire body. So there's no such thing as local inflammation, it's all systemic. That one area where it's injured may have more inflammation, but the rest of the body is inflamed as well. That's why when you have leaky gut, you also get leaky brain. Your blood brain barrier becomes compromised. And what happens when that happens is the inflammation not only is in the intestinal line, it's also in the brain as well. The problem with inflammation in the gut and in the brain is that in your gut lining, the internal lining of your gut has no pain nerve fibers so that it does not sense pain. In your brain, you don't have any nerve pain fibers. Now why do I, why do I get headache? The headache is because the blood vessels in your brain have nerve pain fibers, but the brain itself does not have nerve pain fibers. So when your brain becomes inflamed or your gut becomes inflamed, you don't necessarily have pain there but what you get is, especially in the brain, brain fog. That's a sign of brain inflammation. You get inability to concentrate. That's a sign of brain inflammation. You have fatigue and lethargy. That's a sign of brain inflammation. Depression is a sign of brain inflammation. That's how it shows up, not necessarily pain. But when you have depression, you go to the doctor, do they say it's your brain inflamed? Or do they say you just need Prozac? Right? They tell you you need Prozac because they see it as a chemical problem without looking at the underlying root cause of why you have a chemical problem in the first place, which is usually not the chemical problem. It's usually because you're anemic or you have blood sugar issue, you have inflammation. Those are the reasons why you have a chemical issue leading to depression. So again, ask the reason why. So back to the topic at hand, which is digestion. We started our journey in the brain and we talked about how important it is to chew the food and how the brain through the vagus nerve innervate the gut to tell it to make specific digestive acid, digestive enzymes, get the gallbladder to secrete bile. Remember that vagus nerve that innervates the gut, the stomach, and the pancreas? It also has nerve innervation to the gallbladder to get that to contract and push the bile into your GI tract. So brain is so important. We talk about the role of stomach acid in protein absorption and mineral absorption, the role of pancreas not just in blood sugar but also in digestive enzyme secretion which can lead to bloating, and then we're now in small intestine, which you can have leaky gut. Now what causes leaky gut? Gluten is a known cause for leaky gut. That's why gluten is such a big problem. Even if you're not sensitive to it, just in healthy individual, eating gluten is shown to cause leaky gut. That can eventually lead to problem. So diet definitely is an issue. Lectin is another compound that are found in plants that can cause leaky gut. We also know that stress from cortisol, stress hormones, can cause leaky gut. We also know that cytokines, such as inflammation, 
Inflammation can definitely cause leaky gut. So that's why this is a vicious cycle. Leaky gut causes inflammation. Inflammation causes leaky gut, becomes a vicious cycle, gets worse and worse. So if gut infections can do it. So another thing that can plague the small intestine is, we talked about earlier, SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. But make no mistake about it. You can have small intestinal bacteria, but you can also have small intestinal candida overgrowth. It's not a SIBO, it's SICO. Small, oh, SICO, right? Small intestinal candida overgrowth. You can also have parasite in the small intestine. Very, very common. It's not just in the lower GI. In fact, you can have parasite anywhere in the body, in liver flukes. You can have parasite that can travel in the sinuses. You can have parasite in the brain. So we look for these things, and we actually go through a process to eliminate these things from your body. And you can also have viruses, right? Intestinal virus, we call it stomach flu. Those things can definitely cause small intestinal issues, not to mention autoimmune, autoimmune disease of the small intestine. You can have that as well, such as celiac disease. That's what that is. Okay? Not to mention food sensitivity. That can also affect the small intestine. So all these things that we need to look at. So it's not simply just taking a pill. All right, as we move through the intestinal tract, now we're finally at the large intestine. In the large intestine, we can obviously have infections. All the things that we talked about here, bacteria, yeast, parasite, virus, can all affect the large intestine as well. Okay? You can also have autoimmune to the large intestine, such as irritable bowel disease, IBD, which is uh, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, those type of things. Okay? You can also have um, short-chain fatty acid deficiency. You can also have microbiome deficiency. So these are the good bacteria that lives in your gut. We now know that these good bacteria serves many, many important roles, not just locally in making vitamins, like vitamin K, most of the vitamin K in your body is produced by the bacteria in your gut. So these bacteria has many important roles in producing nutrient for you to help you absorb the nutrient that you're eating. Uh, the probiotics, the microbiome, the bacteria in your gut also is really important in mood, in a regulation of neurotransmitter production, in modulating your immune function. So these bacteria are really important, and these bacteria actually produce short-chain fatty acid, which is a type of fatty acid that actually keep the bacteria themselves alive. So not only do they produce it, but they also keep them alive. And you actually need short-chain fatty acid as a glue to hold the intestinal cells together. And these short-chain fatty acid actually also help control immune function. In fact, much of what these probiotics do is done through the action of the short-chain fatty acid that they produce. And some people have short-chain fatty acid deficiency, either because they don't have enough good bacteria, or they're not eating the right type of foods to produce short-chain short fatty acid. Or they have other conditions like toxicities and inflammatory condition that's decreasing their ability to produce fatty acids. So this is going to be a huge thing. We're going to start to bring in products that specifically are going to support that process. Okay? But this is just what can happen in the large intestine. And obviously, finally, you have to eliminate it. Oh, guess what? That vagus nerve that we keep talking about, the brain, it innervates the small intestine, it innervates the large intestine, and when the brain is not talking to the intestine, you're going to have slow gastric motility. What that means is things are mo not moving through your gut, so things just kind of sits there because it cannot stimulate contract contraction of your intestine. Then you're going to get constipation because things are move not moving through, and as a result of things sitting there and not moving through, these things can start to ferment, and bacteria overgrowth, yeast overgrowth, so you start to get dysbiosis, you get all these SIBO and else infections as a result of just things not moving through. So it may not be because you have a yeast infection or a candida. It may be because your brain simply is just not stimulating the gut to the point where you can have proper cleansing and movement, right? Just like a river, things gotta flow. If the river gets stagnant, things grow. You wanna keep the bowel moving because that's how you eliminate the unwanted junk. And obviously then that's eliminated. So 
Last thing I'm going to leave you with is with digestion issues, the timing of your symptom is so important. I'm going to finish with this. Timing. The timing of your symptom sometimes is a much better clue than even endoscopy, colonoscopy, because those scopes done by GI specialists, they're nothing more than just a camera down your throat or up your other end to see if you have a tumor or bleed, something they can visualize with a naked eye, with a camera. It cannot see microscopic things. They have to biopsy in order to do that. Who wants a biopsy? You know, who wants to biopsy every single section of the intestine? They just simply don't do that. So it's a very difficult thing to accomplish, and that's why they don't routinely do it for everyone. So those tests are very limited. So you may say, I have every test under the sun. When, when sometimes people tell me every test, really? And when I really take a history, every test means I, they had a colonoscopy. Okay, what does that mean? Nothing. The colonoscopy only proves that they don't have a tumor or bleed or polyps. That's the only thing it proves. It does not tell me whether they have short-chain fatty acid deficiency. It does not tell me if they have infections in the gut necessarily. It doesn't tell me about the microbiome deficiency. Those tests are not very useful from a functional medicine perspective, from improving your function. That's why so many people, they have poor function. The digestion sucks. The poor digestion, poor absorption, poor nothing's working digestion. And they do these colonoscopy and endoscopy. They say, the test is normal. I had everything done. $10,000 worth of tests. But it told them nothing. Essentially, they tested nothing. They just told them that they don't have tumor, they don't have cancer, they don't need a drug, they don't need surgery, but yet, functionally, they still function horrible. They feel horrible. So you want to do tests that are functional, that can tell you about how your body is working, not just give you a diagnosis. I'm not interested in the diagnosis. We're not treating the tests. I'm not writing a paper. I'm here to change your life. To change your life, you've got to go a different approach. If you just want a diagnosis, you want to write a research paper, you go the medical route. Just what you want, right? And I think most of our clients come to us because they're sick and tired of that medical route where everything's done by protocols, done by some, some people wrote somewhere, the drug company tell you to do something, but not necessarily what's best for you. People come to us because they want something different. They want someone who cares. They want someone who can make sense of your situation, they actually care enough to ask and run the right test and work alongside you in a partnership, in a relationship that's long-term, that's sustainable, to help you get to the health that you want, okay? So timing, I'm gonna finish with this. The timing of your symptoms is really important. If you get symptom, oh, indigestion, you don't feel good, within 15 minutes, 15 to 30 minutes after you eat, most likely it's gonna be gastric, stomach, okay? Because a lot of times people say, oh, every time I eat, I feel horrible. It's my intestine. Not necessarily. It depends on how long after you eat. If it's pretty soon after you eat, like 15 to 30 minutes, it's most likely gastric. Now, it depends on the symptom as well. If you just feel like you, if you feel like you have burning, even without food, then you may have gastric lining that's damaged. So then you're feeling the acid in your stomach. Not because you have too much acid, because the lining is damaged, so now you feel the acid. Okay? So if you feel burning on empty stomach, there may be some kind of damage to that. So we need to heal the lining first before we can supplement with hydrochloric acid to bring it up. Okay? Now if you have burning after you eat, it may be 15 minutes. That may be because you don't have enough acid, so you can't digest that protein. So the protein's rotting, and now it's developing symptom for you. Or you feel like you have a brick in your stomach after you eat. It just sits there. Oh, I'm so heavy. It's like I have a brick in my stomach. Usually it's because you don't have enough stomach acid, okay? So timing and the nature of your symptom and what goes along with it determines why you have that problem and then the why determines the solution for that, okay? If the timing is that you eat in 60 minutes to an hour and a half, an hour to an hour and a half later, you start developing symptom. Then more likely it's either small intestine or pancreatic something in the small intestine, okay, that area. That's where the problem may be occurring. Now, it's not 100%, but it's, again, you're just gathering clues, right? It's like a court trial. You're gathering all the evidence, and you see how the evidence stack up to help determine what direction you go. You don't just ask, oh, you have heartburn? Here's, here's a prescription medication. Don't take this Nexium. That's not gathering clues. That's treating a symptom. <laughs> That's a completely different approach. Doesn't mean it's wrong. Sometimes you do want to take something, just get rid of that symptom so you feel better, so you can function that day.
But if you keep taking it without understanding why you even had the problem in the first place, you're just masking the symptom. You want to treat the root cause, right? Now, if you have symptom that's much later to where you feel like your bowel doesn't empty completely, you go to the bathroom, you feel like there's still some there, you didn't eliminate completely, you have foul smelling gas. If you have foul smelling gas, like the type of gas that's like, you know, that they use to torture prisoners that, you know, it's just toxic, then most likely you have some type of HCL problem. Because what that foul smelling gas typically is protein putrefaction. The protein is rotting in your gut, producing that foul smell. Now, if you have gas that just kind of doesn't really smell too bad, it's just gassy but doesn't smell horrible, typically that's more carbohydrate fermentation. More likely pancreatic issue because you're not making enzymes to break down the carbs. So again, different type of symptom, require a different approach, require a different type of test to confirm or rule out. Always when you have a symptom, you got to ask why. Why do you have the symptom? How? How are you having the symptom? What's the symptom feel like? Because different type of, just like my tummy hurts. Well, what's the nature of the pain? Where does it hurt? That's really important. And when does it hurt? The timing, right? When does that occur? And with what does it occur with? Certain food, certain environment, certain people, <laughs> right? That's what you all have to ask, which is what we do. We ask these questions so that we can figure it out. It's playing the detective. It's a much higher service above the standard of care, right? Because the standard of medical care is that you show up, you have a symptom, they match up your symptom with a drug, you're done. Five, 10 minute visits, or they pass you to another specialist, so they can all their buddies get a little insurance visit, get to bill another visit to run some tests, everybody makes some money, they just pass you from specialist to specialist. That's the game. Step outside of that if you wanna get true health and let us be that partner with you. So if you feel that this video is helpful for you, please like and share this video with those who you feel can benefit from this. And my purpose is to help as many people as possible and develop that relationship with you. Either it's just on Facebook, or if you wanna take it a level deeper, you can schedule a case review. We work with clients all throughout the country through video consultation. We'll put the scheduling link on this post so you can have an opportunity to do so if you want to work with us on a much deeper level. And. Uh, Every week we bring content that's gonna help you. We're also on YouTube as well. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'll put that link on this page as well. And uh, I look forward to seeing you next week at the Ask Dr. Khan Show. Take care.